I'm uh, really pleased to see all of your faces. It's nice to, nice to have members of the community here and, and friends, people from far away and from nearby. Um, I think you'll enjoy this, this talk. Alan has a reputation of being a pretty entertaining guy, if you can understand his accent. Uh, we have a little trouble over here with that, Alan. <laughs> but, okay. um, Alan is a bit of a, a bit of a rock star in the in the world of deep sea biology. Really? Um, he's uh, he, he did his PhD with a very well known uh, biologist, a fish biologist who works in deep water, kind of a pioneer in that area, uh, Monty Preed at the University of Aberdeen. And Alan tells me, and I found this out just this morning, that he actually did his undergraduate degree in industrial design, believe it or not. He didn't have a background in, in what most of us study. Um, but it served him well because he really made his mark initially by building incredibly sophisticated and high-tech landers, which are devices that I'm sure he'll talk about that you drop to the ocean floor and let them do their thing for a while and collect information for you and then bring them back up. And for a long time, that was the only way that we knew very much about the deep part of the ocean. So Alan's engineering skills served him well um, in getting him to the place where he is today. He's, uh, he's now at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, the East Coast in Northern England area. And um, there he, uh, he is a senior lecturer but he spends a lot of his time gallivanting about the world. Uh, this is a man who's been on somewhere around 50 oceanographic expeditions on something like 25 or 30 different ships. He's, he's sailed the world in, in every sea and um, has become very, very famous as the person who knows the most about Hadal environments. Hadal environments named after Hades are those really deep, dark places in the uh, in the very deepest parts of the ocean. Alan wrote a book recently on the biology of hadal uh, animals, hadal trenches. Um, it's the only book that I know of that has focused specifically on what we know there and uh, it's an extremely uh, important reference work. He's published around 50 or around 100 publications in the scientific literature, but the incredible thing to me is that he interacts extensively with the public as well. So for example, I have a post-it pad here I'm reading this off of. He's, uh, he's given about 11 public lectures like this one in recent years, most of them in person. Uh, he's been featured in around 50 or so radio and television uh, spots, uh, various places around the world. Um, many of you probably aspire to get your name into National Geographic at some point during your career. Well, Alan's work has been featured at least seven times in National Geographic. It's been featured seven times in Science Magazine. Um, and um, he's uh, um, been uh, featured in numerous, probably 10 or 20 different magazine articles that were written about him and about the work that he does. But the, the most amazing piece of information that I uncovered by reading about him late last night is this, that there's apparently a company that, that um, estimates the value of a person and his work to advertising revenues. And because he's appeared so many times on television, radio, and magazines, and so on, um, this company has estimated, I have it just for one year, 2017, that the advertising value of Alan Jameson's work is around, was around $15 million in that particular year. And the estimated audience for all of the places his work appeared was 1.7 billion people during that year. That's why I call you a rock star, Alan. It, you, you certainly are. <laughs> and doing a quick calculation on the back of an envelope, if you, if you do the division with about 7.8 billion people in the world, that means that um, I realize there'll be some duplication here, but about one in five people in the world have heard about Alan Jameson's work in the deep ocean trenches. Yeah. And, uh, and so there we go. You can correct me if I'm wrong about any of that, Alan, but uh, I, I was impressed. I'm not sure I knew half of that, but it sounds brilliant. 
<laughs> so um, anyway, let me just let me just suggest that you turn off your video. Make sure that you stay muted during uh, Alan's talk. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Zoom, I recommend that you look at the top of your screen and um, and uh, turn it to speaker view, which will allow you to see Alan on one side. And then when he shares uh, his screen, you'll see his, uh, his talk on the other side. With that, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Alan Jamison. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Bill with me. Uh, sorry, the Zoom windows are getting in the way of my real windows. There we go. Okay, is that showing up? That looks fine. Yeah, you can see the, the screen. I okay, so the, the, the speaker sort of section with your notes and stuff rather than the full screen slide. Oh, I just want to do that then. Hold on. Sorry, just that one. Just to see your notes. Perfect. That one? Perfect. Yeah, that's Thank you, Heather. I didn't know you were in. Right, so. With a pleasure. Good, good, good. Heather's involved in this work as well. Anyway, right. So, yeah, we're going to talk about exploration at full ocean depth. So, about, oh, I don't know, 12. 15 years ago or something, we were in a pub drinking beer like you do when you're Scottish and a conversation came around as to where the deepest place in the world was and which one of us at this conference had the deepest photograph and it became a bit of a stupid conversation and and, I'm, and we were sort of stood there thinking, why, why, don't, why do people always stop at 6,000 metres? Why is all deep sea stuff two, three, four, five thousand meters? Why, why, why do, why do we call ourselves deep sea scientists when no one goes to the deepest half? Uh, and then here we are. So there's a whole bunch of stuff happened in between that that pint and and now. Uh, and things at full ocean depth, certainly the very deep end, have been, I would say, snowballing in the last 12, 15 years. And you know, when I started doing this really deep stuff, it was pretty much only me that was doing it. Maybe a few Japanese people, and now it's becoming uh, bigger and bigger and bigger all the time and more and more countries getting involved. So, uh, brilliant, it doesn't work either. So my own research interests, is, uh, as Craig touched upon, I'm actually uh, technically an engineer, uh, slightly fraudulent marine biologist, uh, but I managed to wing it so far, so it's all good. Uh, I, I used to still do concentrate mostly on deep sea fish, that's what was driving it, but you know, I design on my own equipment, uh, own cameras and landers and so on. I'm still a bit old fashioned, I still like to be on the deck, I still like to deploy my own gear and still like to be there for it. Uh, historically, I've also worked a lot on deep sea bioluminescence, not so much now. Uh, we've dabbled a little bit in chemosynthetic environments, but as, as, as Craig said at the start, my, my main thing is, is anything deep in the 6,000 metres. I, mean, I, I, I don't discriminate, as long as it's deep, we're all good. So, for those I'm sure most of you will probably know what the halo zone is, but just for the sake of anyone who doesn't, just just I'll just go through a little bit of the basics in that, you know, this lovely diagram of, this is the only graph I'm going to show in this whole presentation, by the way. I'm not a big fan of graphs, but. So if we look at uh, 8,000 metres being the, the highest point in Mount Everest, all the way down to land. So land is this bit here. As you go deeper, there's not a lot between one and two kilometres deep. And what you're seeing here between four, five and six kilometres deep is most of the planet. So. You're looking at the largest habitat on the planet going largely understudied and everything below that blue line is called deep sea. So first of all, I don't really believe there's a thing, deep sea biology, the word deep sea doesn't really work. Deep sea is basically most of the sea. There's the surface and then there's everything else. But for convenience sake, we do uh, divide it up into various components. So when you see that four to 6,000 meters, it's 54% of the planet. We call that the abyssal zone. And when you get to 6,000 to nearly 11 kilometers deep, the deep is 45%, you're looking at what's called the halo zone, which is where we mostly work. So there are two interesting science approaches to this. The abyssal depths are interesting because 
they're so huge and so vast and their stories are all about the horizontal they're all about speciation and biodiversity and de degrees of removal from x y and z whereas Hadel, it's all about the vertical so what happens when you get really really deep you start to get to the limits of what most life can can handle or at least can enjoy so hades is a uh, people who is named after is both the guy himself and the kingdom of death and uh, he's so evil he starts to blur when you draw pictures of him as well apparently and the word was coined by Anton Brun who was leader of the Danish Galathea expedition in 1956 and that was because I think the Russians wanted to call it the ultra abyssal zone and think more of an extension of the abyssal plains but Anton Brun decided that it was different enough that it warranted its own name uh, it shouldn't be an seen as an extension of, of abyssal zone so it accounts only for 2% of the seafloor. I think actually that's a little bit more than that now. I think we're starting to get a greater appreciation for the size of it, but it's certainly 45% of the depth range. So the reasons we do it, is one of the things when I started this is like, you know, we started thinking about going deep. So the first thing you do is you grab the textbooks and go, right, what's all this Hadel stuff about? You pick up a book called Deep Sea Biology and you look up Hadel and it's not in it. <laughs> You're like, well, okay. Uh, picked up another book about deep sea. Uh, it doesn't mention Hadel either. So you've got this weird thing where we're teaching and, and talking about deep sea and we're not going to the deepest 45%. So that for me was like, right, we're doing this. Also, there's a lot to do with depth related trends, how things change when you go down from the surface. And uh, I figured that in the bottom 45%, surely that those, whatever you find there must have great leverage on, on trends that you're seeing much shallower. Another thing, which is probably the most important one is this disruption of the continental shelf and slope and rise and abyssal plane. It's almost a continuum. Things change very gradually as you go down deeper. But suddenly when you get to that Hadel zone part, this transition from abyssal to Hadel, it fragments into these trenches. There's no continuum anymore. They're, they're isolated from one another. They're, they don't uh, correlate with distance or don't correlate with latitude or longitude or whatever. It, it just becomes this disjunct array of, of habitat. And most importantly of all of it is we can't keep ignoring the deep end. The, the ocean doesn't recognize our man-made lines that we draw in it and say, okay, shallow water is important, deep water is less important, or the upper deep bit is more important. It's one big body of water. So I, I think we need to have all of it included. So why is it so deep? The reason it's deep is because the Earth is made of tectonic plates, of the surfaces, the crust, uh, and they can interact in various different ways. So you're looking at what's called a transform boundary or, or a, a faults, looking at uh, spreading centers on, and ridges, and then you're looking at trenches. And examples of those ridges, for example, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you get hydrothermal vents, you get volcanoes, you get the Azores, Iceland, all these things, big mountain ranges, everything's new, everything's pushing apart, creating these new hot sea floors. Somewhere in between that, when two tectonic plates rub together side by side, like San Andreas Fault, in fact, up in Oregon, you guys must know all about this, but uh, you know, that's where they rub side by side, so nothing really really changes there in terms of uh, topography too much. But what happens at subduction trenches is when two collide, and one is obviously heavier than the other one, and it pushes the other one up, and you end up with these big deep trenches. So the majority of the hail zone is in trenches. There are other types, for example, look in this map here, anything with a black dot is an actual trench. It's a big subduction trench. Uh, anything that's Red is called a trough, which doesn't, it's, <laughs> troughs are a bit fluffy in that there are just parts of the abyssal plane that happen to extend beyond 6,000. And you get trench faults, which are the sort of cluster of all sorts of other things that happen to make it deep enough. So certainly beyond 7,000 metres, most of this, most of that area will be deep trenches. So you can see there's a concentration around the West Pacific, which is great if you live in England or Scotland, because you get to go to lots of nice hot places and get loads of air miles, uh, but it's rubbish during lockdown because you can't go anywhere near it. So, some of the way to Hades. What I'm going to show you is actually a, a merging together elements of the last 10 years. Mostly it's going to be, I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent expedition because it's new and it's weird and it's exciting and it's lots of visual imagery and it's great to talk about. There are other elements. So this is part of projects called Hadeep. There was Hadeep 1, 2, 3, and 4. There was Hades K, Hades M. There was Pharma Deep. There was uh, Hades ERC. I don't know, loads of projects. But the one I want to talk about mostly is, is the five deeps uh, and the Ring of Fire expeditions. So 
Five Beaks was a really strange thing. It's a privately funded expedition by an investment banker in Dallas, a Texan guy who decided he wanted to dive to the deepest part in the ocean, which is fine. Everybody wants to, right? Uh, most people don't have $50 million to, to make that happen. But uh, there was all sorts of politics at the start as to why he was doing this or what's the point and is there going to be any science? Da, 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 da. It's a long, boring story that I don't want to get into. But in the end, we did do the five deeps. We did the whole thing very, very quickly. Uh, we did the deepest point in every ocean plus a whole bunch of other sites through the Titanic in as well, just because we can. Uh, and this year, or, or at least at the start of this year, uh, we had a follow on expedition. We decided at the end of the five deeps, we were not done yet. We were still hungry for more. So we, we, did, we did some more that I'll explain as we go. So it started in July 2018, ended September last year. We did 74,000 kilometers in one year. We bought our own ship, bought our own landers, designed and built a submarine, went to 19 countries. Uh, up until the end of five beats, we have ma mapped 650,000 square kilometers. That's now up to 1.2 million square kilometers of seafloor. Did 103 lander deployments. That's now up to 175 as of this year. And then we have a full ocean depth submarine, which is the first submarine capable of doing multiple dives. Up until now, there was only ever Trieste that did one, and there was James Cameron that did one to Mariana and one to another trench. So this is the first time we can just do it over and over again. And it's still going strong. The ship is the former USNS Indomitable, which is such a cool name, they should have kept it. I don't know why they changed it. Uh, it then became the MacArthur II, and, uh, and now it's called DSSV Pressure Drop. So all the names are a bit odd, and that's because they're all named after characters in a sci-fi novel series by Ian Banks. Uh, so don't question too much why the ship's called Pressure Drop, when anyone who does high pressure testing will know that Pressure Drop means imminent failure. But, you know, we've got around that. The submarine is called Limiting Factor. Again, there's some connection with a sci-fi thing. Uh, it's a two-man submersible. It's a really odd shape, and it's a very odd shape because it's designed to go very, very, very quickly. If you use a conventional shaped submersible like Alvin or Shinkai or something like that, it would take hours and hours and hours to get to the bottom. So this is designed to be quick vertically. So to get to 11,000 meters takes about three hours, three and a half hours. Uh, and it's most of it is syntactic foam buoyancy and they calculated that in such a way that the water density increases with depth so you, you ballast the sub in such a way that you want to descend and slow down the whole way you're using the seawater density to change the volume but not the mass of the submarine to then slow it down which means if you're going to 11 kilometers you leave the surface at about three knots so it's it's quite a wild ride if you're going shallower, it's not so bad, but because you need more ballast to get you down to 11,000, you leave like it's a fairground ride. It's, but it's incredibly gentle. Uh, quick tour of the sub. It's got five thrusters either side. It's got a titanium ball. It's only 90 millimetres thick, which feels far too thin, but it is what it is. Uh, it's got huge custom-built lithium batteries either side. These are about a quarter of a million dollars each. Big ballast weight at the bottom. All the oxygen tanks are on the inside. Uh, and it's about four meters high. So see it in real life, that's the ballast weight there. It's got the manipulator arm on the outside, three viewports. So the pilot's got one, the passenger's got another one, and there's one at the bottom that you can both use. Uh, CDT, and it's got four HD cameras on the outside. To complement those, we also put down an array of three landers called SCAF, CLOSP, and FLARE. Uh, these primarily serve as a, a transponder network for the, the sub, so we know where the sub is. But they also carry sample boxes and cores that the sub can theoretically interact with. And then the back end of the lander is where we do a lot of the science stuff. So we have beta camera, we have beta traps, we have CTT, you know, have all these other things. So the landers serve as science and sub support. And there was three of them. There still is three of them, I don't know, so I'm just used to losing stuff. So the five deeps as an expedition was mental. It was crazy, stupid thing to do. But, uh, but jolly good fun. So it started in July, August with sea trials over the sub off the Bahamas. And then we did advanced sea trials, which is a very clever way of saying it didn't work. So we had to go back and do it again, but we call it advanced to make ourselves feel better. Then we did open ocean trials, which is a, a way of saying we tried to dive Titanic, but the weather was too bad and we didn't get to it in the end. Uh, and then we had the expedition launch, Explorers Club, of course, wonderful. 
and then we did Puerto Rico Trench in 2018, and that was the first deep. Uh, and then we went straight to Antarctica via Uruguay. We had a hell of a time down there. It was awful. Uh, just, just too late in the season, I guess. And then uh, after Cape Town, then all the way to Australia, we did a, a deployment in the Diamantina Fracture Zone. Then we did the Java Trench, which is where, in my opinion, the, the science took a, a turn for the better. I think we started getting some really, really cool stuff, which I'll show you later. And uh, then we went to the Mariana Trench, and, and we actually did five sub dives in 10 days. On the third sub dive, we actually lost a lander, got stuck in the bottom. And then we put down another lander and put the sub down and managed to rescue a lander within 50 minutes of getting to the seafloor at 11,000 meters deep. So there was all sorts of really interesting things that came out of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Then uh, some of us stayed on board and we went down to the San Cristobal and Santa Cruz trenches to do lander work. And then we went down to Tonga Trench and we dove the deepest, the second deepest place in the world. And then we went back to Puerto Rico, did some work there. And then by August the next year, we managed to do Titanic. And then we went up to do the last of the five deeps, which was Malloy in the Arctic. And then we all had a good night out in Edinburgh. And then we got a really couple of good nights out in London at the end. And that marked the end of that. But since then, we've gone on to do the, the wreck of the Minerve of Barcelona, the deepest place in the Mediterranean. Uh, we went into the Red Sea, the brain pools in the Red Sea. Then back to Mariana Trench in, in uh, 2020, and then ended up doing a bunch of lander work in a place called Black Hole. So that's basically what I've been doing the last two years. It's pretty manic. So the data I'm going to show you, and at least the stuff I'm going to talk about, is, is mostly from Five Deeps, but a lot of it is built upon where all these red dots are on the map. And what we're trying to do is, is on a very broad sense, we're looking at biodiversity, population structure, hail communities. There's, nobody knows very much, to be honest, about these things. We, do, we know more than we let on we do about deep sea, but when you get the deeper you go, the more that starts to fall apart, especially in geographically. We want to look at habitats, you know, how, 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 how similar, how variable these things are. Looking at how these communities change depending on big geomorphological features and how each feature changes from one to another and how that's influencing so on. Bigger scale stuff and the genetic connectivity between those. Also, there's lots of people working on the adaptation to high pressure, low temperature, to seismic disturbance. Uh, and there's also, the, of course, the anthropogenic impacts at the very deepest points. So without further ado, I'm going to get on the video because it's, it's what I spent most of yesterday doing. Uh, I'll just talk through it. Just, oh, sorry, where did that not one? Oh, don't do this to me. Well, it did work. Okay, so there's the ship. This is a good ship pressure drop. Uh, as I say, it's not overly large for a research vessel, but it's, it's great for sub support. That's us deploying one of the landers. As you say, we just lowered them into the sea and pull a quick release and then they crash land to the bottom. Uh, so half the first half of the data I'm going to show comes from the landers. The second half will come from uh, the sub. So we've got a full complement of people on board. We've got wet lab facilities, although not great relative to other ones, but so here's a lander going down. I've just put in a couple of examples of some really interesting landings. This is us landing at 6,000 meters in Puerto Rico. Uh, it is actually a crash land. I wasn't joking about that. And the types of fire you see are, we tend to start at around four or 5,000 meters and work our way deeper. So we do that so there's some sort of overlap between normal deep sea and what we do. So when you get to the four and a half, five thousand 5,000 meters, you tend to get engulfed with these, which are the deep sea rat tails, the grenadiers, these are Corphenoides armatus, very curious animals, they turn up very big numbers and they just tear the living daylights out of whatever food you give them. Very predictable. Uh, their footprint on this planet is, is phenomenal. Uh, so are these things. When you get down to 6,000 meters, you have these pinnades, a type of decapod uh, called the Benthosicumid cronatus, uh, and they're incredibly uh, predictable, very common between five and seven thousand meters. The deepest one we've found so far is about seven thousand seven hundred. They're very skittish as well. They're very difficult to catch. They're easy to film but they almost certainly never go into traps which is very frustrating. Uh, they're predators so you see all those little animals buzzing around there. Uh, they're in to eat those. This is just a great fast start response from when he's saying it jumps so fast it buries itself in the sediment and then there's this weird sort of Polaris missile thing coming out of it. So 
the other, the other fish to look at, this is the upper hadal depths, let's say around six to seven thousand meters, you get these cuscules. This one, particular one's called Barathrites. Uh, this is a scavenger, so it's probably the last fish you'll find in the sea as you go deeper that will actually eat your bait. Everything else thereafter will eat the amphipods that eat the bait. Particularly these guys, these are something we'll talk about at the end, these are called Basozetus. Incredibly common. These are animals that uh, 10 years ago we figured was really rare. Very, very rare. Now I'm thinking this thing probably inhabits half planet Earth. They're everywhere. They're just that bit further offshore and that bit deeper than we normally go. But wherever you go, it's at least 5,000 meters in the Pacific and the Indian and some parts of the Atlantic, you'll find these guys. The deepest fish of all of them uh, are these guys. These are the snailfish called the leparids. Uh, these are down to at least 8,100 meters. Uh, we discovered these about five years ago. It's kind of common names in Mariana snailfish. Very gelatinous. You can see the livers if you look through the side of the body. If you catch one, you can shine a light right through it. Unbelievably fragile. They use this gel rather than skin and scale so that they can maintain uh, close to neutral buoyancy without a swim bladder. They're still hydrodynamically streamlined. They've made all sorts of sacrifices and adaptations for deep sea. Also, so have animals like this. Now, all those little white dots that are buzzing around are amphipods. The big, huge thing in the middle is called the supergiant amphipod. So it's actually the same genus as some of those tiny ones. Well, it's the same family anyway. Uh, it's called a supergiant because it's massive. <laughs> That's a bit scientific as that gets. Supergiants are frauds as well. They're not actually big amphipods. They're actually mostly hollow. They're, they're small amphipods masquerading as something huge. So they've just made this massive exoskeleton to try and avoid being eaten. Like if you watch this guy here, uh, he's not getting those. Uh, so it's quite a good tactic. And they've got this really spiky tail, it's telson, that you've noticed there when the fish comes in, it spikes it up to stab it in the mouth. There's also some interesting geological findings as well. This is just from July this year. We put this lander down and it slid into what looked like an old vent field. You see an enormous big orange thing on the left hand side. Uh, that's at nearly 6,000 meters. That's incredibly deep for this type of thing. Uh, also, this is all what we think is an old pyrocrastic flow. This is at uh, 6,000 meters in Antarctica. Do you think Antarctica? That's pretty hardcore. The temperature here is just less than zero Celsius. You're at 600 bar pressure. There's obviously a lot of volcanism going on here. And then you wait two hours and you get a whole bunch of new species of snailfish turn up. And again, just, I love the fact that snailfish are so unperturbed by everything. They just they just bumble in and do what they want to do and leave again. Uh, fortunately, we never caught any, but we're pretty sure those are new species because there's essentially no records whatsoever from that part of the world at those depths. Uh, next thing is isopods. Some of these, these, these videos are from the Atacama Trench of Chile from a previous to five deeps expedition and you see these enormous uh, isopods, very very long legged things, which are unbelievably fragile. Ignore the three fish at the front, they're eel pouts, they're just lazy, lazy fish that don't deserve mentioning, but there's another species of uh, isopod here that has these oars, this beautiful swimming motion through it, they're mesmerizing to watch, and you get this other one, that's, uh, they're all monopsids, uh, this other one that has these paddles and you watch them just like paddling through the water. Uh, fascinating animals. But isopods are problematic for us because whereas the amphipods are easily captured in big numbers and a relatively low diversity, isopods are very difficult to catch and their diversity is just through the roof. You know, you never see the same one twice. Uh, it's very frustrating. Obviously very uh, important part of the community. That thing there is called Crassoda. It's a Trachymedusa jellyfish. That's the, the deepest jellyfish ever filmed. Uh, as is this one here. This is from 9,066 meters in the Mariana. Uh, and kind of graceful, really quite nice. Reckon they probably go as deep as 10,000. They're certainly not at Challenger Deep because we've done enough filming there, we've never seen them. But this particular species is very common in uh, certainly in the Mariana. Crossota, possibly Halba. We've also recently discovered that there are larvations, that weird cloudy thing. The, the, the transparent ball is in it's the mucus house. The, the, the things inside are, are in their filters and there's a small animal just behind them. So they're larvations. They weren't known to be idle at all. It turns out they totally are. They're everywhere. This thing here is probably the weirdest thing we've ever filmed. Uh, it's an, a, a skidian. It's a stocked skidian that's supposed to be attached to the seafloor, but for reasons we don't know, it isn't attached to the seafloor. And for reasons we'll never work out, randomly just drifted past the camera and freaked us all out for 
probably weeks until we figured out what it was. We thought it was an inflatable Snoop Dogg head, but apparently that's not taxonomically correct. Then we've got a other big find from this place. This is from Java. Another big surprise from Java Trench was finding octopus at 6,000 meters. You're not supposed to get octopuses. You're just supposed to get careful pods at those depths. Uh, at that point, the deepest octopus ever found was 5,400 meters, and then this one turns up at 6,000 meters. So we're thinking, ooh, we're onto something here. This is a big deal. And then the next day, there was one at 7,000 meters. So this is the Grimpetuthus, the Dumbo octopus. Uh, there's a very, very lucky isopod involved in this next sequence in that the octopus takes the isopod and for reasons we don't know, rejects it and eventually it walks off. But I think it's really nice to see that even at 7,000 meters, this perception of the deep sea is, is, is thrown apart by these beautiful animals. This is a CG model. This is not real. This is completely computer generated. This is to show you what an amphipod looks like when it's at its happiest. It's just a skipping little amphipod. This video is from 11,000 meters in Challenger Deep. This is a lander with no bait. And you can see there's, there's that's a real one this time. Uh, and there's the amphipods going about their daily business on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, if you bait the system, you get a very different result. So amphipods are voracious in terms of their ability to detect and intercept and consume and store any food that comes their way. So they tend to become the prey for everything else. Uh, they're amazing at turning uh, food to, to lipid very, very quickly. They have stretchy guts so they can eat more than they, they can uh, handle. These time-lapse videos here will show, demonstrate quite how quickly they will take two macro carcasses. Uh, these are photographed every minute at various different depths. So the more, the, from whatever angle you take on this, it always comes back to the importance of, of, of amphipods at some point or other. And this next video is a time lapse from six and a half thousand meters in Antarctica. And the one thing to watch is just how many amphipods turn up and how quickly the bait's consumed. But if you cast your eye to the background, you'll start to see hundreds of brittle stars coming in as well. So again, this is a photograph every minute. So this is six and a half thousand meters. This is one of these places where people tell you nothing's going on. And there's these big empty voids and the deep seas some sort of barren place that nothing ever happens. And here, in the space of eight hours, we're looking at unbelievable consumption rates and very high population numbers. So from the sub, it's not an easy thing to get into. Uh, in fact, it's not. It just isn't. It's, it's awkward. There's no graceful way of doing it. Uh, we have to do it over the side of the ship. We're not allowed to do it on the ship because we don't have a certificate for lifting a sub with somebody in it. So we do it this way, which is slightly better than our previous way, where people broke bones and things. But uh, you have to climb down through the top part into the hatch. Uh, again, it's not particularly graceful. It's not particularly spacious. Time-wise, once you're in there, you're looking at something like 12 hours door to door, uh, three and a half hours down, three and a half hours up, the rest of the time on the sea floor, and a little bit of time on the surface as they try and track you down and pick you up. So. Uh, Temperature wise, it's pretty good. Yeah, your feet will always freeze at the end. That's the only thing. There's no, there's no real way of maintaining any blood supply to the lower half of your legs ever, uh, except for when you're in the Red Sea, because the Red Sea, the temperature is so high. By the time we got out of the sub, it was about 44 degrees Celsius. So to deploy the submarine, we tow it behind the ship for a while. Uh, eventually, we flood the airbags, tell the, tell the ship we're off. And then it suddenly just shoots under the surface. Very, very graceful. We're flipping to CG again. Because uh, this, this, it just looks cool. There you go, lights on. Uh, and on the way down, there's not much to do. There's lots and lots of safety systems built into this. So we have to call the surface every 15 minutes. If we miss two calls, they'll automatically drop the ballast weights and we'll come back up. If you get stuck on the bottom, you can jettison the thrusters, you can jettison the battery packs. You can almost throw away most of it until there's nothing much left but you inside the bowl. Uh, and the first thing we normally do is put a lander down to mark the start position. So we go down and we spend a bit of time hunting around, interrogating the lander until you find it. And this is an example here of actually rendezvousing with the baby camera. You get these lovely shots of each other, this weird meeting on the deep. And uh, so in terms of sub data, we're looking at uh, the first one is the Kebrit brine pool. This is the shallowest one we've ever done. It's only 1500 meters. It's these beautiful sponge beds. Uh, we went to the 
uh, University in Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, and worked with them in the, in the Red Sea, and we did a few dives. This is one of the shallower ones, but for us, it was just fascinating to see all these, these sponges and see all these vents. You can see these small black vents sticking out the, the wall there. And as you go down, you're getting closer and closer to the brine pool. So there's this super saline lake, essentially, at the bottom of the Red Sea. The lake is on the right-hand side. The orange bit is the shore. Okay, uh, you can actually see the, the brine lapping on the shore there as the sub passed over it. And also all these lovely vents, it's almost like the beach. It's just, it was, it was the most peculiar dive in that there was just something to look at all the time. It just, the, the entire habitat changed every five minutes. It was, it was just fascinating. Other than the sponges though, it is distinctively void of life. There was really not much going on. So it was very much a geological exercise. But yeah, so that was one of the most fascinating ones. Uh, there's Titanic. I'm not going to dwell on this too much because everyone knows the story of Titanic. Apparently it hit an iceberg. Apparently it sank. Big rusty thing now. The, the little dot in the background is another one of our landers. Right, so the five deeps. This is the bottom of the, the shallowest of the deep. This is Malloy in the Arctic. And you can see the biodiversity is really high. The habitat is very rugged. Uh, it's because it's part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's a hole that's been so pulled out of the spreading center and there's loads of sponges. The place is absolutely covered in feather stars, which are a type of, type of crinoid. Uh, makes it very difficult to analyze because it's just there's literally hundreds of animals per frame. This is the deepest point in the Puerto Rico trench. It's a beer bottle. That was quite symbolic uh, of, of Puerto Rico. So very, very flat seafloor, lots of holotherians, lots of uh, uh, actinians. What sets Puerto Rico apart from the rest of them is just the volume of sargassum on the bottom. It was just it was just everywhere. I mean, but that's what it's famous for, right? It's just this constant rain of macroalgae coming down, which creates habitat and so a flow of carbon. Yeah, uh, this is Penny Agony, which is a holotherium, which is particularly common in most trenches. This is the second deepest place in the world. This is a Tonga Trench, which is 10,800 meters. It was a strange one because it looked that perhaps maybe there had been a big landslide relatively recently because the sediment was really flat, really smooth. No signs of any tracks, no burrows, no nothing. It, it was suspiciously clean. Uh, but unfortunately, we only got one dive there, so we did not really have time to have a proper look around. But that's certainly the place that's called Horizon Deep after the American ship Horizon. This is the Java Trench in the Indian Ocean. This is my first dive. I think this is probably one of my favorite dives. I think it was just fascinating. We went up the fore arc, which means we, we go down the deepest point and then start going up the hill towards Indonesia. And we just found that that slope, the bit that you in your mind you always think is kind of flat, kind of steep, but it's, it's the trench wall, turned out to be absolutely insane. There's all these big boulders hanging precariously on the end. There's these big orange and white and yellow stains on the seafloor, which are almost certainly chemosynthetic of uh, bacterial mats. There's a big overhang here, which is full of these sponges as well. This is Challenger Deep. You can tell it's Challenger Deep because there's loads of rubbish sitting on the bottom of it. And I'll talk about that later, but Challenger Deep itself is really kind of flat, sedimented. Not that much going on. Lots of holothurians. Uh, very little current. When you move off, in this case, we're in the second deep now. This is Serena Deep. Uh, it's punctuated by a lot of these big boulders, always draped in sediment. Lots of uh, these actinians which are like beautiful flowers almost, they're just sort of sitting there. You notice the rocks are all kind of hairy. Uh, we think those are hydroids, although we've not been able to bring a, a rock back yet. Uh, in this particular case, we found this huge, what looks like a huge sulfur mound. So we'd love to go back there and try and get samples of that. But what we took away from those big deep dives were the habitat is unbelievably variable. This is also challenging deep. When you get to the edges of the central pool and start going up, it's just a mass of rubble. It's just the, it's just this. So you've gone from the the most finest, softest sea floor I think we've ever worked in to that within five hundred meters. Again, look at the rocks; they're all kind of hairy. So I think this whole place is laced with hydroids. Someone said they might have been these tiny crinoids, but I don't know. They look a lot like hydroids to me, but we'll see. So at the end of the dive, do something dramatic like go back to the lander and watch the, and then you can watch yourself dropping the weight at the end, which is what happens here, eventually. Go on. There it goes. 
and then you come back up and then you're three and a half hours on the way up on the way up we normally watch a movie because there's literally nothing else to do but just bob up and down by that point everyone's cold and hungry so it's quite the operation uh and so that's coming back coming back in is actually more of an operation and trying to get it out because they have to find you you have to be in the right orientation and they, they have to put a guy in the water to snap you on and da, 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 da. the whole thing takes about probably 30 to 45 minutes to get you back on board the ship in the end so but it's a great day out and i thoroughly recommend it so let's talk about the bad stuff first i like to talk about the bad stuff first so we don't end on the bad we'll end on the good so we go away with smiles the bad stuff is What's become quite apparent over the recent years is this this idea that the deep sea is quite remote and it's pristine and it's far removed from the stuff that we are, are doing as, as a civilization on the surface is, is not true. It's actually the opposite. So what we're finding in places like just Mariana, as you, there are studies coming out that are showing traces of the H-bomb testing from the 50s in amphipods at Challenger Deep. Uh, there are people who are showing very high concentrations of lead in the snailfish we found absolutely skyrocketed levels of PCBs, which are plasticizers. They're man-made and banned now. Uh, we found those in the Mariana amphipods, plus lots and lots of flame retardants as well. So that's not so good. Terrible, in fact. And then we looked, we went back through our archive and we looked around six different trenches uh, and analyzed those for microplastics. And the, the lowest of all the trenches was the New Hebrides trench, where only half had plastic in them. The worst was Mariana because every single one we looked at had at least one fibre and one of them had as many as eight. And we've also got some preliminary data that show things like uh, nickel concentrations around New Caledonia, for example, are very, very high uh, and so on. So unfortunately, there is this emerging appreciation for how badly polluted even the deepest systems in the world are. And I think the take home from this is we've already missed the window to, to, to study some of these species in a natural habitat. Because we'll never know what they were supposed to be. People always ask, well, what are these chemicals doing to this animal? He says, I don't know, because we didn't know what they did before. We've, <laughs> we're too late, if you like. The next thing is just the volume of rubbish. Uh, it's pretty mad. Uh, certainly Puerto Rico, but I mean, in a place where there's a hurricane zone, it's not necessarily a, a story of human folly. I think this is just a story of, of civilization that stuff ends up in the sea and stuff ends up sinking. We find everything from gates, garden gates to uh, tarpaulins and magazines and unbelievable volumes of cans and beer bottles. There seems to be a lot of drinking has been going on in the seas. Uh, Java trains, there's a lot of plastic and things like that. But one of the more worrying things, this is this is new, the first people we're ever going to tell about this. Uh, and as this is something from this summer, which we got hints of last year, is the amount of plastic coated fiber optic cable that's been dumped in the Mariana. Uh, and this is a weird thing because this is other nations who shall remain nameless are using technologies that use a discardable or jetsonable communications cable on their exploration vehicles. Some of them are scientific, some of them are not so scientific, but they're exploration vehicles. They're, let's just call them scientific vehicles. And at the end of the dive, they cut the line. And what it's doing is every time they dive, that dive site is now no longer a place we can go because there's a tangle hazard. So. When you get down to the center of the western pool in, in challenger deep it's a very dangerous place we can never go back there because there's too much of this stuff there's yellow cable all across the central pool and there's this white stuff it looks like long laying stuff but there's, it's not it's fiber optic so we've recently tried to set up this recommendation that basically from now on nobody dives the west end of the western pool because it's it's basically been booby trapped with discarded fiber optic cables from science vehicles which is sad because it means that the site where Picard and Walsh went in 1960 is now essentially a no-go area. You just, you, you'll be crazy to go there because there's just too many things to tangle you up. So let's, that's the bad thing. Let's get happy again. Let's think about beauty in the kingdom of death. I don't even know what that should look like, but it seemed like a good thing to write at the time. Ten-year highlights. Most of this stuff came from the last two or three years. You know, in, in a short period of time, a very few of us have been doing this. We've managed to double the number of fish that we know about at Hale Deaths. And I would say, honestly, the majority of them came from the last year. Uh, the deepest fish we now know is 8,145. And it's actually this goofy little guy here. It's called the ethereal snailfish. Uh, I've also found that eels, the Angola form, they go down to at least 6,058. As I said before, we've pushed the limit for cephalopods down to 7,000 meters. 
the decapod or crabs, shrimps, lobsters uh, are represented down to 7716, which is the Pinead. Deepest jellyfish now is at least 9066, probably a little bit more. We even spotted a siphonophore at nearly 8,000 metres in the Mariana. It wasn't a great video, but it was definitely a siphonophore. Plus, we know larvations are there now as well. So we start putting these pieces together. You have all the usual suspects that you normally have in other deep sea bits. There isn't this sudden emptiness, this sudden sort of change of, of scenario. It's, it seems to be a slightly different flavour, but the same processes and the same ecosystem functions are happening regardless of how deep you are. Uh, the other things is obviously more of a, a league table score sheet is we've probably got somewhere in the region of 500,000 discrete samples from the last year alone. We've got samples of certain species or, or genres of amphipod from 12 different trenches now around the world and somebody I've got somebody working on that right now and it's, be it's showing beautiful stuff it's basically showing the, the 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 genetic similarity of these populations roughly marries up with the distance that each trench is apart from one another and things like that so we're looking at how speciation is mapped onto large-scale tectonic movement if you like there's at least 40 new species discovered over a million kilometres of seafloor mapped. We've got over a million kilometres, a million metres, sorry, of CDT data up right down to the bottom because every time the landers go up and down, the sub goes up and down, we take a CDT cast. And we've got over 100 undersea features to name, although we're running it in names after about 30. So <laughs> we might have, to, might have to do something about that. But some of the big highlights for me certainly are, are this, this, this whole thing about these really extreme habitats. It's not just this... Uh, deep sea slope going down to the deepest point, there's all sorts of interesting things. There's these big sulphur mounds in Mariana, there's these vents in Mariana, uh, there's evidence of sulphur in Tonga, there's these beautiful bacterial mats in Java, and I think these are the next steps to go and understand the significance of those in terms of what it's doing in the Halo community. Uh, there's also a great story about the endemics. I mentioned snailfish before, but snailfish are, and the big cuscules are interesting for two reasons. Remember I said before about abyssal is all about vertical yeah, it's all about horizontal, hail is all about vertical. The vertical influences things like snailfish. Each trench has its own species of snailfish. Normally, there's one really dominant species between six and a half and seven and a half thousand. And in amongst them, there's normally this sort of not so dominant species, I forget the word for it, but one that's a bit rubbish. Uh, so there's normally two, and it's weirdly consistent throughout them all. And then we start doing this genetic work, and you can see that they're uh, they're not related really at all. So they've all sort of, I mean, sailfish are one of these families that are uh, still radiating. There's over 330 different species of them from shallow and freshwater all the way to the deepest. And I like the fact that the deepest fish in the world isn't really a deep sea fish, it's a shallow water fish. So it's quite audacious in that respect. Uh, but more and more information is coming out about this, this endemic thing. Uh, but then you flip to things like the supergiant that in 2013, we thought the supergiant was a once in a lifetime find and this thing is super rare and da 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 da. Now we pick them up and film them and don't even bother. We just put them in the fridge because they're, they're, when you go out, that map there I'm showing in the Pacific, the dark blue bit is everywhere we think you should see super giants, the big cuscules and the pinnades, right? So you look, you know, think about that in terms of the size of North America. These rare animals are not rare at all. They just occupy a space where we never go. Uh, and significance is probably huge. Those Cuscules are big fish. It can be up to over a metre long. If you leave the camera down for at least eight hours, you'll have five of them, five, six, seven, probably even more than that sometimes, in front of the camera. So the biomass of that animal we think is really rare must be huge. And that's one of the things we want to have a look at. So in terms of ending on a high, I think we just need to challenge this whole idea that a lot of people think the TB the go, these big deep trenches don't are not characterised by high diversity, but if you look at that, every single thing on that slide came from a Java trench in the space of four days. You know, you've got every major group really represented. Look how many fish you've got there. You've got larvations in there, you've got amphipods in there, mysids, octopus. You know, there are diverse places, and, and I think I've got to show slides like that to try and prove to people that there's loads of stuff going on there. Each one of those, there's probably half of those, if not more, are probably new species. Also, if you look in the Mariana, I'm fed up of hearing people talk about the Mariana as being some final frontier in this place that no one understands, in this cold, deep, dark place where megalodons hang out. Actually, it's kind of cool. Everything there is from the Mariana Trench, albeit the fish only go about halfway down. But even at the bottom, you have 
uh, hexachromalia, you have holothurians, you have the actinians, you have the galathians, the one I can never pronounce, the galathia thingy, uh, and so on, and unbelievable abundances of, of amphipods. So, you know, I'm really pleased I can show you that because 10 years ago we never had that. Uh, it was literally like Mariana's a weird place only Don Walsh would go. So, to sort of write up some sort of conclusion, the deepest places are not out of sight, out of mind. I don't like the idea that uh, people are still talking about dumping stuff and, 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 and lots of these plastics programs are always concentrated very much on shallow water because people should appreciate that anything that goes in the sea is going to sink and once it gets to the deepest point there's nowhere else for it to go. So it can only ever accumulate, it will never disperse or, or, or dilute. The deepest places on earth are not barren lifeless places at all. They seem to be quite highly diverse. You've just got to look for a different suite of animals. I think the more we understand, the more we start looking into chemosynthesis as well on the forearms, the more that's going to open up a whole new new area. And the deepest places on earth are now accessible. All right, there's only one sub right now, but the Chinese are also working on AUVs. The Russians have recently got a full ocean depth AUV. Our colleagues in Denmark are using a lot of different biochemistry landers now. Uh, uh, Woods Hole now have a, a prototype AUV as well. So there are more and more vehicles coming online. So the excuses for not going deep don't exist anymore. So I think that this now time that the halo zone is, is sort of pulled by the hair into mainstream deep sea biology. So I thank a whole bunch of people, far too many to mention, but you know, this has obviously been a massive group effort. I'm not by any way taking credit for, for most of this. Uh, it's taken everything from sub designers to ships captains and private investors and finance guys and lots of scientists and students and so on. And uh, I'll just take this opportunity to say thank you. We also have an artist on this as well, which is quite nice. Alice Gould, she did this lovely painting. And uh, I'm often asked if there's places where we can see more of the Halo Zone online. Uh, if you look at the, the, the web addresses at the bottom, if you want to see more videos and more of the stuff from the sub and so on, go to www.caladanoceanic.com. There's some videos on there. I think they're mostly on YouTube as well. And if you want to hear more about the science, uh, myself and colleague have a what's called a deep sea podcast. So we basically ramble on ranting about this type of stuff uh, for free. So I'll leave that screen up just now. So if you want to take the QR code, you can. And I guess I'll hand back over to Craig. Okay, that was that was fantastic, uh, Alan. I think we should. I think we should perhaps begin by um, asking everybody to turn on their videos again so that we can see their faces. And Sorry, Zoom doesn't have a Scottish filter, but <laughs> one day. Yeah, if you go to gallery view again, uh, we, we should be able to see everybody. Uh, let's give Alan a, a round of applause for a fantastic talk. So there you go. There are several times more screens than that than you can see. So so you can try and imagine that, Alan. Oh, yeah. I'm assuming that you might be willing to answer some questions for us. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Yep. Who has a question for Alan? Sebastian. So one of my questions is, like, a lot of the fish that, I, that, that you showed down there have kind of these pointed tails instead of the uh, split tails like normal. I know that like a lot of lot of ancient fish always had those. So why have they diverged? Why is there why is our fish on the surface dominated by the split tails and fish on the underside dominated by pointed tails? There's two cool reasons for that. One is if you have a normal fish tail, it's it's very bad in very low currents. It tends to stall. So in terms of like just hydrodynamics. If you want to move fast or you want to move slowly but in fast water, you need a big flat tail. If you live in the dark, i.e. the deep sea, there's no need to be fast because where are you running to, right? You're in the dark, no one can see you. So you want to stay slow, maintain energy because there's hardly any food supply anyway. So a whip-like tail will keep you moving without the expense of having the muscle power to push to make you fast when there's no need to be fast. But the interesting thing with the rat tails, I love this fact. This is a cool fact. They've got these big long whip-like tails. But you know, when you see them feed, they're all sitting there crazy tearing his bits out of each other you often see them with their tail cut off right so one of them's bitten the other one's tail off but it it can't grow back the spine obviously 
So what it does is it, it grows back a little paddle which has exactly the same hydrodynamic force as the longer whip tail. Right? So it can't can go back to the way it was, but it could compensate with a different design. I think that's, you see them quite a lot. Really odd little rat tail with this little paddle, little ping pong bat at the back of his tail. It's cool. Anybody else? Yeah, I had a question concerning kind of the future of deep sea exploration and if you see uh, private patrons really playing an outsized role or was this Five Deeps kind of a one-off guy who just got it in his head that wanted to do this? I think there are different flavors and it's already happening. So Schmidt Ocean Institute, you know, Falco has been going for years. Uh, what, five, six, seven years now? It's all funded by the Schmidt Foundation, which is Eric Schmidt and Google. Uh, if you look at Ocean X, it's Ray Dalio behind it. If you look at Rev, it's the, the guy from Iceland, I can never remember his name. Uh, these are, it depends what flavor they take. So what Schmidt's done is put together an institute to do all this stuff. Dalio's got his own ship that he works with other people, but he does his own thing. Victor was very much, this is his thing. He wasn't, he didn't put that together to let other people use. He put it together so he could do it. Uh, there are other people in Australia who have, who have recently renovated uh, private yachts to be more scientific. There's also another one I know in Hong Kong. So you're going to see more of it. And I think we're going to need more of it because getting funding for these big expeditions is through government one is really laborious and I find really depressing because you never get money for pure exploration anymore. You can't go to the government and say, I've no idea what's around that corner. Go and give me like two million bucks and I bet you I bet you fifty bucks is something cool over there. You're just, you're just not gonna get that. But you go to some of these more private people and these guys with big money and say, look, I've got a hunch that something over there is gonna be great. If it doesn't turn out like that, we'll still have a great time. And that's that's a different way of getting funded, I think. I'm all for it. I think it's great. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, did you have a question? Yeah, Neil did. Okay. In the areas where you found the objects that had been left behind by previous expeditions, did you see evidence of either private or government sponsored uh, exploitation or exploration for extractive industries, especially mining? Yeah, sort of. Uh, in that area, I think. Uh, how do you say this when you're broadcasting on the internet? There is a certain <laughs> nation that has a, an interest in stuff that goes in and out of Guam who, who do not currently occupy Guam. Uh, the, the, there's certainly stuff down there that has uh, been deployed in the last few years. They're not that secretive about it. Uh, and the reason why they are going deep is because it's beyond the capability of let's say the US Navy, they can't go that deep. So it actually, it's not a case of they want to go down to the bottom of the Mariana, but they think if they put stuff in the bottom of the Mariana, no one's going to find it, which is quite interesting. So there's that. In terms of deep sea mining, I think no one in their right mind will try and mine at those depths. I think it's, 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 there's enough issues trying to make mining at half that depth economical. I can't imagine there's anything like that, but certainly some of the EUVs that are being advertised in other parts of the world recently, I think they get branded as scientific exploration, but if you scratch beneath the surface, you'll find it's actually uh, more like resource extraction surveying, I think. There's a big gray area in there. Thank you. Oh, and a really wonderful talk. It was so interesting. I oh, love the isopods. They were wonderful. So They're thank you for all showing all of them. Oh, yeah. All, all that beautiful life and the colored fish that was just lovely. No, I think the isopods are what beautifully creepy in that. <laughs> I'm glad they're on video I and mean, I'm glad they're really small. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can make a serious yeah, right. great alien movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, imagine that was like two meters long. Like, uh, yeah. Alan, you've got a wonderful audience, many of whom I'm sure are thinking, How can I? How can I follow in his footsteps, meaning you? And I'd like to ask, what are some of the big questions that a young scientist can answer? What deserves focus? 
Well, in terms of how, how do you follow from this, I would suggest you go into your own car lot because it was the car lot in Oregon Institute for Marine Biology where I first nearly threw up in public <laughs> because I, as, as Craig said, I didn't come into this as a marine biologist. I came into this as, as an engineer and Craig hosted the Deep Sea Biology Symposium there. The 2003, 2002, something like that. It was in 2003, that's right. And uh, I had never given a public presentation before in my entire life, never done it. And my boss was like, no, you're doing this one. I'm like, why, why do we have to do my first one in front of 300 people in Oregon? And he went, no, no, just do it. So when I started off, it was in your car lot, thinking, what the hell am I about to do? <laughs> it's like trying to pass myself off as some sort of marine biologist when actually I've never been so nervous in my entire life. So I don't know what, what I think the way I've always come from is, is if everyone else is doing it, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'll never touch deep sea mining because three quarters of the deep sea community right now is, is falling over themselves for, for mining money. And, and I don't see that as being interesting. I think the ocean's a big place. It's great that people are doing mining issues, <laughs> but I would say, I, I almost think that, well, everyone else is doing it, so it's covered. I don't need to join in. Uh, also, at one point, lots of people were just working on vents. It was all about vents, 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 vents. I think, okay, that's covered. And it's just looking around and, and looking for spaces where no one else is working in. And I remember thinking one day that, uh, I forget what the story was, but it was somebody talking about some aspect of deep sea and they said, oh, you just couldn't do that. That's never going to happen. And that's where you make a mental note to yourself because someone said you couldn't do this. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's where there's an opening, right? I think that, that that's all I recommend is, 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 is not do what everyone else is doing. This ocean's huge. There's got to be careers for everybody. Mm -hmm. What was the other part of the question? Sorry, I've forgotten. I've been rambling too long. Well, uh, I think you answered it very well. Uh, you know, the question is, how does a young person find out his or her uh, big question to work on? And I think you gave good advice. Yeah. It's easy to jump on the bandwagon, but I guess you have to start somewhere. If there's, if there's a job going, you take it. But then you just try and find that niche that you need, right? And that's, I was lucky enough to find quite a big one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's bottom, <laughs> so it's bottom 45%, but yeah. Huh. Joanne. Hi, Alan. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question that's maybe not in your area of expertise, but um, Sorry. part of the project that you uh, showed us is during the descent and ascent parts, um, you mentioned that the CTD instruments were on. Mm -hmm. um, are the cameras and lights also on during that time? And can you, do you get profiles of the animals? Going too fast, unfortunately. Going too fast, okay. It's yeah, so as I say, when you leave the surface, if you're going a deep one, you can leave at three knots. So if you watch the video back, it's like it's snowing upside down. <laughs> it's just, you can't make anything out. Occasionally there's like one, was it, I think it was the Red Sea dive. There was a, some sort of weird sea snake that was trying to follow us. It actually sort of swam down with the sub, but to be honest, it's going too fast. Yeah, you, you can make out the occasional jelly and stuff, but nothing is quantifiable. I did ask about this, but it, 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 it's one of these trade-offs. This submarine was designed to get down deep quickly. It wasn't designed to hang around in the midwater. Hmm. I wanted to mention something. This isn't a question for you, Alan, but uh, right as the talk was beginning, we actually had an email from um, a fellow named Kelly Walsh whom you know, I think. Mm -hmm. And he's the son of Don Walsh, who was the first person back in the 1960s who made the very first dive in the Mariana Trench. And Kelly and Don um, actually live here in Oregon. They live up by Myrtle Point in a place called Dora. And um, I think both of them were on Mariana dive, maybe some of the other dives as part of the Five Deeps mm -hmm. expedition. And um, Kelly indicated that he was delighted that you were here giving a talk to us today. Uh, he wished he could um, he could um, uh, join us. I, I think that maybe the internet is not very good at the place where they live, so they never did 
join us, but uh, we had Don Walsh here at OIMB 10 years ago to give a talk about his experience diving in the Mariana Trench. Uh, this is the book that talks about it, Seven Miles Down, and he, he actually autographed it for me uh, at, at the beginning. And uh, he did say that if he, uh, if he could have, he would have volunteered to introduce you today, but he couldn't be oh. here as part of the, the talk. So, yeah, so uh, Don came with us on the Mariana trip last year. So he came on the ship. He didn't go down in the sub, but he came on board. Uh, and it's just an incredibly funny, insightful guy. He's got a story for everything. Kelly came on with us on this year's one. So those uh, tethers on the Western Pool, it was Kelly who was in the submarine during that dive. Hmm. So, because if we put Kelly down on the same place that his father went down in 1960, which is kind of cool. Anyway, I've always found it fascinating that we have this, this uh, incredible connection locally to one of the giants of... Uh, of deep sea and especially Hadel exploration. I used to think that I used to, well, I used to live in Aberdeen in the north of Scotland and I was there for about 15 years before I knew that the guy who discovered the Mariana Trench in 1952, not the original Challenger, but Challenger 2, Rear Admiral Steve Ritchie, he was the highest ranking hydrographer the Navy has ever had. He lived two miles away from our lab and I got invited to his 94th birthday party. And then unfortunately he died a couple of years later, but it's one of those weird moments is like and you lives in this little village that you've almost never heard of it's like <laughs> this is the guy who, who found challenger deep and he's just this guy he's just absolutely mental and in his 90s it was great <laughs> quite amazing does anybody else have questions uh sebastian yeah so you visited a lot of the deep places like oh like a lot of the subduction zones has anyone uh visited like rift zones like like the rift zone, trend, uh, like cracks or, or the mountain ranges and rift zones yet? I, yeah, I think mi Middle Ocean ridges have been studied quite a lot. There's been lots of ROV trips through various fracture zones. I think the Charlie Gibbs fracture zone in North Atlantic is quite a famous one. The Russians have been down there with the Mir submersibles and so on. I think what would be a really fascinating shift, if you, ha if you had to move away from trenches into something else, I think it would be the the big fracture zones, the big deep fracture zones like Romanche or a whole bunch of them in the Atlantic to be honest but there are other places like the Emperor fracture zone that's up by the Illusion Isles and stuff like that. I think we, we're starting to get a handle on trying to disentangle what's an effect of just being deep, i.e. what's Hadel and what's been driven by the fact that it's in a subduction trench. I think if you start to study more of the same animals but not in a trench setting, in a different one like a fault or, or wherever, you start to get an understanding of what's driving what. And we've had a few snapshots into fracture zones, like the black hole was a kind of weird, non-seismic, non-trenchy environment. And we went to the Wallaby Zenith fracture zone a few years back. And there are some similarities, but there are also some dissimilarities. So that allows us to pick apart what's causing what. But I think the trenches are so seismic and so big and so habitat wise so different from the rest that that must be controlling a lot of what we're seeing in an ecology point of view. Nancy, do you have another question? I do, and it's um, along the sides of the communities. Um, it's fascinating that you take one dead fish and it seems like, you know, from miles away, mm -hmm. organisms find their way, start, you know, in, uh, getting moving towards it. Um, the energy input from the top, the ocean, although it's obviously happens, it, it's pretty rare, I would expect. So do these organisms, do you have any idea about these organisms' lifespan? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, they're cold, right? So I'm kind of looking at the energy budget and how I'm these- gonna, I'm going to throw out a really speculative thing as if it's a fact. It might not be. It kind of is. Now, if you look at the lifespan of deep sea fish, those macruids, the grenadiers, if you look at their otoliths and their heads, you can age them. It's very tricky, but you can do it. They seem to live between anything between 40 and 80 years. Right? Oh. So they live out on the abyssal plains where nothing ever happens. There's no seismics. There's no real big events. There's a bit of seasonality. You can travel huge distances without changing pressure too much. They're old fish. And they're of, a, they're of what's called the ancient invasion of the deep sea. So they used to have shallow water ones, but they're all gone. So they're an old relic fish. When you look at the snailfish, 
you'll be lucky if they're 15 years old. They're much, much younger. And one of the theory to that is that if you are living in a seismic area, if you're in a trench which is having earthquakes all the time, there must be huge sediment slides quite a lot. There must be resuspension of sediment. There's basically perturbations all over the place. If you're an animal that doesn't spawn until you're 30 years old, you're not going to last that long in an environment where 10% of your population is getting knocked out every other year. Right? So it, th that really stark difference between the abyssal plains and the trenches might be something to do with the seismics, that you need these fast turnover populations to survive in, in a more energetic and more complex and almost catastrophic environment. But in terms of food supply, there's more at the bottom than there is in the middle. So if you imagine it comes down onto a flat abyssal plain, you have, let's say, 1% of the surface. If that plain then moves into a trench, Pythagoras says that that to that to that is longer than that. So then you already have a reduced amount, but because of the seismics, it seems to get pushed towards the middle. So when you look at sea cucumbers, whenever you see lots of sea cucumbers, you know there's loads of food, right? They're not stupid, you know, like cattle. Uh, if you want to see huge and huge amounts of sea cucumber, you go to the deepest point. If you go up to, up to the top, the six, we always call the 6,000 meter mark the no man's land. Because there's not really, the abyssal species are kind of gone and the halo ones haven't really started. So it seems that the most impoverished zone is about halfway down. And then things start to get better again. That's really interesting. So it the trench concentrates the organics. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah each, each trench is a different depth. So. Sorry, we'll, we'll take some more questions, but I want to inter interrupt the question and answer uh, just for a minute. We just had Don Walsh, the great Don Walsh, join our Zoom call. And uh, I don't know if he has his, um, his video on, uh, but Don, we would love it if you would say something about your experience. Say hello to our audience and uh, maybe talk just a little bit about your experience with Alan. Are you there? Don, you've got to take your mute off. You've muted yourself again. You're still muted. Down on yeah, the left. There you go. There you go. Well, hello, everybody, and I want to thank Alan, my shipmate, my esteemed and valued shipmate, for <laughs> visiting our neighborhood, because, uh, as you know, it's you and I just live a little ways apart, but it's, uh, it's light years apart, literally, because out here with my coin-operated internet system, uh, all the video formats, Skype, app meeting, you pick it, I'm, uh, I'm uh, incognito, because video doesn't work. Obviously, the voice does. Alan, anyway, I want to wish you uh, a happy trip here electronically through the ether and uh, tell everybody else that you're one of the best scientist shipmates I've ever sailed with in the past six decades. Thanks, now Tom. it's time for you to and I don't want to take too much of your program up. I just wanted to say hello and welcome from the southwestern shores of Oregon. Thanks, Don. That's, thus ended the morning lesson. Thank you very much, Don. That was wonderful. I'm I'm really happy that you were able to join us. And thank uh, you. Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll close the meeting soon. But do we have any other? A Avery, one of my PhD students, has a question for you, Alan. Oh, go ahead. Uh, moving on, what was asked and answered in Nancy's question about concentration of food? and maybe more biological hotspots, would you have any insight on possible establishment of deep sea marine preserves that could be considered maybe really important areas of preservation? Not that deep. I've yet to find anything that deep which is of concern. I think that I can't see anybody mining at greater than 6,000 metres. I think you, you, you hit such a a shift in technology at 6,000 meters. There's so many parts that you can buy rated to 6,000 meters and so few parts that you can get rated deeper than that, that anything you do deeper than 6,000 meters becomes exponentially more expensive. So I, I don't see any commercial operations super deep. Uh, in terms of protection, I think I've thought long and hard about this, but the, the issues 
environmentally that we're looking at, at hail deaths, are not something that any kind of MPA is ever going to address because we're looking at mass contamination of PCBs that were banned in the 70s. They're still floating around. They're just, as they float around, they sink. We're looking at flame retardants that were banned in the 70s. We're looking at plastics. The plastics we found in the stomachs of the Mariana Trench amphipods, we had analysed, and they looked like first-generation plastic textiles. Now that's a frightening statement when you think about it because it's first generation so all the stuff in the water column hasn't reached there yet. So the 100% contamination is before there's a, the big dump comes over the next 20-30 years. So I, I'm, I'm not sure where, where conservation, what good it can play when it comes down to these deep bits because you're fighting against something which is like everywhere. You see what I mean? It's very sad. When you think about it, it becomes really depressing. <laughs> uh, looks like Sebastian has one more question. Uh, yeah, Emma Piero wants to, wants to ask a question. I was just raising my hand for her. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, you're talking about all of the fiber optic cable in um, the Mariana Trench. And um, it just, it's really sad to me that it's a no-go zone now. Um, I was just wondering, is there any way to like recollect that, like with a lander or with like a sub or something to like clean that up? Theoretically, yes. You could just grab onto it and then drop the weights and try and hope that you pull it all back to the surface. But I don't think anyone in their right mind would try to do that. Because if you're in a free swimming human occupied vehicle, you don't want to deliberately attach yourself to something that you don't know how long it is and you don't know if it's attached to anything, right? It's a, that's a pretty big gamble. Likewise, if you were to somehow get a submarine to then attach or couple it somehow to the lander, again, what happens if it's wrapped around a rock somewhere and the lander comes up and then suddenly you've just moved your lander at 500 meters? And it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. I mean, the, the best thing I can think of is, is to try and attach a float to it. Put a beacon in a float and try and hook that around it and then just back the sub right off and put a dissolvable link or something on the float. So after four hours, the link breaks and the float comes up and you just hope that it's enough to pull it to the surface. But if you don't know how long it is, it makes it very risky. Very risky. I'm sure Don would agree. I don't think anyone in the right mind in a submarine would go yanking on a cable. Okay, last sure. call for some final questions. Don Walsh, did you have something? No, I was just uh, agreeing with Alan. Uh, that's the last thing in the world that I'd want to do is to, uh, that's the maritime equivalent of buying a pig in a poke. Just leave it alone and stay clear of that place. It's just too bad that it's locked out, probably a very interesting place to do research, but that's one of the things we have to do, work around it. That's it. Okay, Alan, that was an absolutely tremendous lecture. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, let's give him another round of applause, Anda. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll cut you loose in just a minute, but let me just remind everybody that uh, Alan's talk will be broadcast during a period of a few hours tonight between six o'clock and 10 o'clock p.m. Um, it will be available on the OIMB YouTube channel. So if you want to watch this talk again, or if you have friends or relatives who might be interested in it, uh, you can certainly tell them where to find it. Um, I think we'll have a large number of people tonight who will be watching your talk um, during the rerun, during the replay, Alan, because many people find it difficult to come at 10 o'clock in the morning for a, for a seminar. Oh, I know. So do I, to be fair. I'll, uh, I'll let you. I'll let you know what your time zone. So it works fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank you all very much for participating. There will be another public lecture about the relationship between sculpture and science uh, that will take place in a few weeks, or in uh, towards the end of the month. And you're welcome to come to that. And you, you're also welcome to come to the more scientific ones that are every single week. Just email me and ask me for the, the link. Uh, if you're interested. Actually, it's the same link, so you can just join if you're here on, on today's talk. Uh, thank you very much, Alan Jameson, and uh, thanks. thanks to all for participating. Bye.
Thanks. Oh, nice.